On my channel, and indeed in so much of life, a lot of what we look at and consider are myths, myths about the past. And so in today's video, what I want to do is to do a little bit of discussion and investigation into the different ways we can approach myth. We can approach myth from a historical angle, or we can approach it as a route for inspiration for us in various respects. And to do that, I'm going to look at one particular uh, story or myth from early Buddhism. If you're new to this channel of mine and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to this channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. So on this channel, I'll often discuss early Buddhism from a historical angle, because that really does interest me, the early history of Buddhism, what it might have been like, how we can reconstruct it. On the other hand, I think a lot of us know of early stories of the Buddha. In fact, oftentimes the, uh, the way we will come to Buddhism will be through some of these myths, such as the myth of the Buddha leaving home in the middle of the night, seeing um, a sick man and a dead man, an old man and a, a monk, and through that experience, uh, that terrible experience for, of death and illness for the first time, his decision to leave the palace. Uh, that is an early myth, uh, one that does not have any uh, real historical basis. Uh, and I, indeed, I discuss some of these myths in my course over at the Online Dharma Institute on the Buddha's life, if you're interested in that, and I'll, I'll leave a link to that course down below in the show notes. But in early Buddhism, even more than that, or more interesting than that, is that the Buddha himself told stories about the gods and about deep history that are, to an extent, ahistorical. They're myths without any real historical basis. And so what I'm going to be doing today is looking at one of these stories, a very famous one called the Aganya Sutta, in which the Buddha is in discussion with a couple of young Brahmins. Uh, these young Brahmins have left home in order to become uh, renunciants and uh, potentially to join the Buddhist monastery, to be become monastics, Buddhist monastics. And it's said that the Buddha is in discussion with them, and they say that uh, after having left home, they have been abused and reviled by their uh, Brahmin compatriots, uh, basically because their Brahmin compatriots uh, see them as sort of turncoats, as sort of people who have given up the ordinary Brahmin lifestyle, which is a lifestyle of being a householder. And these Brahmins say to the Buddha, that they've been told, only Brahmins are Brahma's rightful sons, born of his mouth, born of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma. You've both abandoned the first caste to join an inferior caste, namely these shavelings, by that means people who've shaved their heads, fake ascetics, riffraff, black spawn from the feet of our kinsmen. Now, there's a lot going on in this abuse of these two young Brahmins. Uh, a lot of it is due to the Vedic notion of creation of the world and the creation of humanity, which I'll get to a little bit later on in this video. Uh, but the basic point here is that these Brahmins are uh, being accused of basically giving up their caste uh, system, giving up the caste system in general and giving up their own caste of being Brahmins in order to sort of become renunciants, which is somebody, in a certain sense, without a caste. It's certainly within the Buddhist Sangha, you, you, you're not expected to have a caste. You're, you're basically beyond caste at that point. But the point here is that in order to rebut this Vedic creation myth, the Buddha essentially creates a new creation myth. He suggests that the world was created in a certain way, he, he, he discusses this with the Brahmins, or at least he presents it to these Brahmin youths as the real way that the, that the earth was created. And he talks about basically the universe being cyclical, that it goes through periods of contraction and expansion. And he says that in the last universe, the, after that universe contracted, basically all the beings that were alive went up into a heaven, became sort of luminous beings, 
that he says fed on rapture. Now exactly what this means is a question, but essentially I think uh, at least it suggests that these were beings who were in deep states of meditative absorption, states that were very pleasant, such as the jhanic states that, that one can attain to nowadays if you do a lot of meditation. And one of these, uh, one of the feelings that we get when we're in deep jhana is, is called, is well, the English term that translates a Pali term is rapture. It's a kind of a very blissful, happy state. And so it's said that these uh, beings, after the con contraction of the last universe, basically became sort of gods, godlike beings, uh, uh, not, not gods in the sense of being uh, uh, eternally existing or uh, immortal, but nevertheless gods for a period of time who fed on rapture. And then once that universe had contracted, then it began to expand again. And then uh, the Buddha says that before there were any celestial objects, before there were any stars or suns or anything like that, there was a, an enormous mass of water that seems to have covered everything. And then this enormous mass of water was covered over with what is what is termed nectar, a kind of a very delicious uh, substance that could feed beings. And these beings who had been deified, who had been gods for a period of time, then were, I, sp I suppose, passed away as gods and then were reborn, many of them. It's more and more were beginning to be reborn in this sort of earthly realm as opposed to being up in the heavens. And then it's said that these beings began to, or one of them anyway, tasted this nectar that was lying on the top of the, this uh, vast ocean and delighted in it and, and found it uh, delicious, tasty. And it's said, the Buddha says, that it's, that is the origin of greed, of desire, of, of wanting things. So that greed was born with this first taste of this nectar that was sitting on top of this massive ocean. Then the Buddha says that once this greed or this craving was born, he goes on, then those beings started to eat the solid nectar, breaking it into lumps. But when they did this, their luminosity vanished. And with the vanishing of their luminosity, the moon and sun appeared, stars and constellations appeared, days and nights were distinguished. So long as they ate that solid nectar, their bodies became more solid, and they diverged in appearance, some beautiful, some ugly. And the beautiful beings look down on the ugly ones. We're more beautiful, they're the ugly ones. And the vanity of the beautiful ones made the solid nectar vanish. So here we have a kind of a myth of sort of luminous, godlike beings um, that are sort of not really uh, material beings, sort of become material beings by ingesting this nectar. And then they, their own greed and, and conceit about their, the way they look and their beauty um, is so corrosive that it causes the nectar to evaporate or go away. And then the, the, the story goes on, the, the story is quite long, I'm not going to go through all of it here, but the basic idea is that through this, we've already seen the origins of strife in this idea that some people are beautiful and others are ugly, uh, but this strife then continues and eventually uh, this leads to the creation of a sort of a ruling class that's going to sort of take over and 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 help uh, adjudicate the strife or, you know, uh, punish the wrongdoers and so on. And then there arose the caste of Brahmins or the, uh, the sort of priestly caste. And then there was the caste of, of householders or uh, merchants. And then finally the caste of workers. And so it's said that basically what the Buddha is doing here with this uh, sort of vast story, this uh, myth of creation, is to uh, describe the origin of the caste system in social terms. So basically the Buddha is saying that the caste system didn't originate with the gods, and we'll eventually get to what, how that is supposed to have arisen in the Vedic conception, but rather that the caste system arose among society, with societal strife, with egoism, with conceit. 
sort of this decision that, you know, I'm better than you, or, you know, I am someone, so-and-so is prettier than so-and-so. The question, though, for today's video, at least one question that we can uh, uh, consider, is, is the Buddha's story of creation historically accurate? And uh, I think it's pretty clear that it's not historically accurate. Uh, it's a myth. Uh, the Buddhist monastic uh, Bhikkhu Sujato, who's also a translator and scholar, has asked these questions. He asks, how true are these stories? Or better, what kind of truth should we seek in them? They certainly do not agree in all details with the record of the past as interpreted by scientists. And here Sujato, Bhikkhu Sujato, is talking about this story as well as several other similar stories of Buddhist creation because they're, the Buddha gives several sort of overlapping kinds of uh, accounts of the creation of the world and, and various uh, other uh, mythic elements in the past. Now, but the question for us, though, is were these stories meant to be historical? And I think that's also very questionable. Again, Sujato goes on to say, It's obvious that the main purpose of myth is not to preserve historical facts. As religious stories, myths deal with moral and spiritual truths, and, importantly, how these truths are lived out in a community. So these myths are not intended to do some kind of science or to preserve some uh, scientifically accurate picture of history, but rather to reframe the past in, in convenient or skillful ways. Now, I've heard some say that, uh, you know, the people in the past had no conception of historical accuracy, that somehow the idea of being historically accurate was foreign to people in the past, and, and I don't think that's true at all. Uh, people in the past understood historical accuracy as much as we do nowadays. However, when the Buddha or anybody in the past was coming up with a story like this, they weren't holding themselves out as historians. What they were doing was something quite different. They were providing inspirational backgrounds, inspirational framings, for their own message. And that's true just as much for people today as it was for people in the past. So, for example, people may talk nowadays of Honest Abe, Honest Abraham Lincoln, or they may talk about the, the myth of George Washington chopping down the cherry tree when he was a youth and then refusing to lie about it to his parents. These are myths, basically, but they're used all the time in certain kinds of political discourse to a certain end. And the people using these myths may quite well understand that they're not necessarily historically accurate. I mean, Abraham Lincoln wasn't always honest, and certainly George Washington was not a perfect being by any means, but uh, we use these uh, to frame the past. Now, uh, the scholar Stephen Collins has uh, looked at this Aganya Sutta and has noted that many of the elements that the Buddha uses in his description of the past, some of the ones I've actually gone through here, such as the, the origins of uh, this kind of uh, uh, delicious material on top of the water, there are aspects of those stories that reflect aspects of the, the monastic code, the Buddhist monastic code, the Vinaya and that suggest that these early beings were violating certain kinds of monastic elements of the monastic code, and that it's through those violations that the world declined into a stage where, we, where the, the caste system arose. And so the Buddha may have been uh, uh, pitching this in a way that was obvious to, his, uh, to some of his audience, that he was essentially discussing the fact that, that the, the monks should keep up the monastic code. And the scholar Richard Gombrich has argued that this Aganya Sutta is basically a vast satire of the Vedic creation myth, and the myth in particular of the creation of the caste system. And this is something that I've been uh, referring to a number of times here already. Uh, basically, the idea of the caste system seems to have originated at least textually speaking, in one of the early Vedic uh, poems. 
in this poem, it's discussed that uh, basically humanity arose from the sacrifice of a great human being. There's some sort of cosmic great human being who is sacrificed by the gods. And uh, from that sacrifice arises uh, humans in general, but the caste system in particular. And each of the castes is said to have arisen from a different part of this kind of cosmic human, where we should understand that the parts higher on the body are parts that are more worthy than the parts that are lower down on the body, because the parts lower down are sort of closer to the earth, if you like, and the parts higher up are closer to the heavens. So if we look at this part of the early Vedas, what we read is, when they apportioned the man into how many parts did they arrange him? What was his mouth? What his two arms? What are said to be his two thighs, his two feet? The Brahman was his mouth. The ruler was made from his two arms. As to his thighs, that is what the free man was, or the merchant. From his two feet, the servant was born, or the worker. So the Vedas portray the caste system as having divine origins, as having its origins in this sacrifice of the God, from the gods of this sort of cosmic man, if you like, or cosmic being. Uh, and the different, the different castes ar arise from different parts of this cosmic being. And we saw that reflected in that early passage that I read from the Aganya Sutta, where these two young Brahmins are being berated by some of their Brahmin companions. I'll read it again so that you can remember it. They said, Only Brahmins are Brahma's rightful sons, born of his mouth, born of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma. You've both abandoned the first caste to join an inferior caste, namely these shavelings, fake ascetics, riffraff, black spawn from the feet of our kinsmen. So what the Brahmins were accusing these two young Brahmins of having done was to basically give up their position as having arisen from the mouth of this cosmic deity or cosmic man to arising from his feet, which is the position of the servant, the menial, the people on the lowest rung of this caste system. And so now we can sort of see how, as Gombrich, as Richard Gombrich proposes, the Aganya Sutta is meant to be a kind of a myth that is satirizing and indeed attempting to refute and rebut of the earlier myth from the Vedas. That instead of this being a divinely established system, that the caste system is instead something that is humanly created out of greed, out of uh, conceit, and similar kinds of uh, tormented mental states. So it can be beneficial to consider early texts and early myths, both from a historical and from an inspirational angle. Uh, both of them can have their place. Now, my interest is generally to look at these texts from a historical angle, but I certainly agree that that, that approach isn't for everybody. In history of religions in general, there is a distinction made between looking at texts from a historical focus and looking at them from a faith focus, we might say. Now, within Buddhism, the role of faith is slightly different than the role it has in Western religions, so I guess I wouldn't use the word faith here. I've done a, video, a couple of videos on faith in Buddhism. I'll leave a link to one of them down below in the notes. But what I would say is the distinction is more generally one of looking at them from a historical focus and from an inspirational focus. And it can be important to, to look at either one. As I've done in this video, I've looked at the historical question, are these, is this myth real? Is it a real picture of history? Well, not really. Uh, of course, there are always going to be elements that we can pull out that are suggestive of the history that we actually believe happened, just as the same is true with the myth we find in the first book of the Bible, of Genesis. There are aspects of that that we can say mirror in, in vague ways what we believe about history. Deep history, I mean. Uh, but 
We can also look at these for, from a point of view of inspiration. And my point here is that we can really do both. We can do both even at the same time. So we can look at this Aganya Sutta as a kind of an ahistorical satire, uh, or we can, or I should say, and we can look at it as an inspiration for leaving behind the caste system, as a kind of a reframing of the past in order to take away the, the power that the caste system might have over us. Now, some people will think of a historical focus as something that sort of takes the magic out of myth, that takes the magic out of the story, that demeans it in some, uh, in some respect. Now, I personally don't see that at all. I think history only adds to the picture. It doesn't detract anything. And this is why, for example, uh, when we get into many later histories or later stories in religions, we'll find aspects that certainly are mythical, but also aspects that are apocryphal. You know, later stories in Buddhism, later stories in Christianity and other religious uh, uh, belief systems that are not literally true in a historical sense. Uh, they're not literally discussing the people that are perhaps, uh, they're not discussing literal happenings or, dis or, or statements of the people that are necessarily discussed in the texts. But nevertheless, such texts can have great inspirational or religious or dharmic importance. I say this because I think sometimes people will confuse the two and sort of say, well, if so-and-so, perhaps if Doug here is saying that this text isn't, uh, isn't historically accurate, that it's apocryphal, or it's a later text, that therefore it isn't worthwhile. And I'm not saying that at all. Uh, later texts uh, may be extremely worthwhile, may be extremely important, may even be enlightening in their own ways, uh, without necessarily being historical. They can still be apocryphal texts. So I think it's important when we do this kind of work to, to separate our question of history, the history of the text, or its histor historicity, uh, versus its inspirational value. Uh, that way, I think we can get the most out of texts and still be doing good history, because I think history on its own is very important. And in that regard, I did an earlier video on whether the Buddha is historical, to what extent we can talk of, talk about, a truly historical Gotama, Buddha Gotama. If you haven't seen that video or I'd like to see it again, I'll leave a link to it up here on the screen. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, uh, consider taking a look over at my Patreon page, which is linked down below, and seeing if you want to help support the work that we're all doing here. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video.